Welcome to this PCR e-course entitled Mastering Complex Calcified Aortic Stenosis. The session objectives will be to review imaging assessment and management of complex calcified aortic stenosis, to discuss TAVI in complex aortic valve stenosis, and also to learn about device selection and implantation technique in these anatomies. This session will be built in three parts. We're going to see a case presentation and an imaging analysis. And next, we're going to talk about complex calcified aortic stenosis, how to use implantation technique and device selection optimal. And finally, we're going to see the case completed and discuss the outcome. I'm here with Mohamed Abdel Wahab from Leipzig in Germany and Gigi Chichi from Toulouse in France. My name is Lars Sondergaard and I'm a cardiologist in Copenhagen, Denmark. So let's start with the case presentation, Mohamed. Um, thank you, Lars. So um, the case um, I'm presenting uh, today, I don't have any disclosures to declare. It's a case of an 89 years old uh, gentleman who, um, as you can see here, um, had um, normal um, body mass index, so um, um, bodily state um, very um, nice uh, compared or um, when you consider his age. He had a known uh, coronary artery disease um, with a um, previous stenting of the left anterior descending coronary artery with a bare metal stent uh, 12 years ago and had a pacemaker implantation due to complete AV block um, five years ago. The patient presented to our um, center with progressive uh, shortness of breath um, and he had a syncopal attack one month before presentation, which was actually complicated by rib fracture and a pneumothorax. And since then, the patient had dizziness really on um, minimal exertion. And because he was a little bit unsure um, how to deal with this, he was uh, bound to um, um, some sort of a, a walking aid. The um, imaging analysis you can see here, his echocardiography showed the normal left ventricular ejection fraction with some concentric left ventricular hypertrophy normal right ventricular function, mild mitral and tricuspid regurgitation, um, an elevated systolic pulmonary artery pressure of 45 millimeters mercury, and a severe aortic valve stenosis, a clear um, form of severe AS uh, with a mean grade of 41 and a value area of 0.7 and mild aortic regurgitation. When you look at the uh, echocardiographic images uh, in this, uh, on this slide, you can notice here that on the posterior mitral leaflet, there's some sort of a um, calcified chunk, which is, appears to be uh, similar to what we see in patients with caseous degeneration of the mitral valve. And um, there is also a rel relative, relatively big calcified mass located on the right coronary cusp um, and more or less riding on the interventricular septum, this mass was measured on echocardiography to be around two by two centimeters. Um, these are his uh, CT images. And as you can see here, he has um, a rather nice femoral axis, but with some tortuosity of the uh, descending and ascending aorta. Um, you can also see here that um, if you look at the aortic valve leaflets, they are a little bit moderately calcified. And you can see here that what appears to be um, a contrast filled space um, exactly at the position of this uh, mass we've seen on echocardiography. So at that point of the time, we're really not sure what this mass signifies. Um, because it appears in these images at least to be um, filled with contrast or at least having the same attenuation as the contrast material um, we see in the aorta. Um, and we thought maybe this is some sort of an old yield abscess or some sort of a pseudoaneurysm. So we, we, we were not really sure what this is. 
what helped us a little bit to um, um, characterize the dignity of this mass was this um, non-contrast um, 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 assessment of the aorta. You can see here that this mass appears to be here in this native CT scan to have the same attenuation as the calcification present on the aortic mass. And if you compare it with this uh, mass you have on the mitral valve, you can see this on the lower right part uh, or panel on this slide. You can see that all um, three um, parts look alike. So the leaflets, this mass and the mass on the mitral valve, which suggests that this is some sort of calcium. And we were uh, thinking that probably the caseous degeneration on the mitral valve is also present on this right aortic cause. Um, when we considered this patient for TAVI, one um, additional challenge was how to measure the annulus. Um, and we weren't quite sure whether we should include this mass in our measurements or not. So these are the three variations you can have. And you can see here that if you include the mass, you can have a perimeter of up to eight, uh, 82, 88 millimeters and a, an area of up to 525 square millimeter. If you exclude it, you are much smaller. And if you are somewhere in between, then you are somewhere in between. So sizing, sizing uh, in this case was also a little bit a matter of concern. So um, if you look at the um, some additional information here, apart from the imaging analysis, you see that this patient, according to the traditional risk scores, is rather an intermediate risk patient with an STS of 2.9 and a logistic U score of 15.6. But he is frail according to these uh, objective frailty criteria. And to summarize the case, um, we thought that this is clinically actually a clear candidate for TAVI, uh, considering his age and frailty, but anatomically he's quite challenging. He has good peripheral access, but some aortic virtuosity. He has a big chunk of calcium at the bottom of the right cusp, extending deep into the interventricular septum with suspected caseous degeneration. And we were uncertain how to correctly size this annulus. Thank you, Mohammed. That was an excellent uh, case presentation. I mean, it was a very interesting anatomical finding. We can see that the patient had a really severe calcified aortic valve, but there was also this uh, additional finding about a big chunk of calcium or aneurysm in the close to the right coronary cusp. But what is your interpretation of that uh, from your CT scan? Yeah, so I think this is something we, we see quite seldom. So it's it's not a common finding. So this is why we weren't, uh, at the beginning, we weren't quite sure what this is. So on echo, it appears to be calcium, or at least similar to what we see on the mitral valve. Then when we looked at the uh, contrast images on CT, then it looked like as if it was like not calcified or as if it's something that is filled with contrast. But what helped us really, and this is what our uh, radiologist also suggested, let us have a look at the native CT images without contrast and see if it's uh, calcified or if, it's, if it has the same attenuation as the valve leaflets and that um, structure on the mitral valve. And after looking at these native images, I think we were quite confident that this is a calcified mass. It doesn't fill with contrast, so it's probably not connected to the, uh, the cavity or to the aortic root because its attenuation also did not change with contrast enhancement, mm -hmm. which if you like uh, count this with Hounsfield units, it, 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 attenuation remained the same. It just looked like as if it's filled, as if it's filled with the contrast, but it's not. Um, uh, we were not quite sure, however, if this mass is really uh, full of calcium or if it's just like a calcium shell and um, it contains some sort of caseous material or some necrotic material, we're not sure. So, Gigi, have you seen anything like this uh, during your extensive experience with aortic valve stenosis? Yeah, it's, it's true that this is a very uh, rare uh, finding and I uh, uh, only remember about the one case that we had in the past and uh, we had uh, the feeling that maybe this was a kind of sequelae of uh, a previous endocarditis from the patients to the kind of abscess that uh, became a little bit calcified uh, after healing. But it's true that this is really rare, and so it's really difficult to anticipate what is going to be uh, uh, the outcome uh, in terms of uh, 
immediate result after a device implantation. So it's a, it's a really rare situation. I'm, uh, I'm really looking forward to see the, the final outcome for, for this patient. But I, I guess I, I agree, it seems to be a more like a, a Casio's uh, degeneration. So, I mean, so now we have seen this patient have severe calcified aortic stenosis with this big chunk of calcium in addition to calcium on the leaflets or the cusps. So let's disregard this patient as an old frail patient, but just look at the anatomy itself. So, so facing an, a complex anatomy like this, um, would surgical aortic valve replacement be a better option than transcatheter aortic valve replacement in this kind of anatomy? What do you think, Gigi? Uh, personally, I would uh, still uh, recommend uh, TAVI for, for this patient because it's true that we, we could only focus on the anatomy, but we uh, still have to uh, uh, consider the, the features of the patient. And this is a clearly frail patient. So if we can avoid surgery for him, I think it's the, better, uh, it's the best option. And then comes all the discussion about the, uh, the risks of the procedure. Uh, if we consider that this is a case uh, degeneration, it's a rare situation. So we don't have an extensive experience uh, with that. So we need to be uh, really cautious in terms of device selection, procedural steps, and result evaluation uh, during the, the procedure. So uh, it's I think it's still feasible to, to undergo there for TAPI but it requires a lot of preparation and anticipations of uh, various uh, scenarios during the procedure. But I would so, still go for a TAVI for this patient. So, so if you do TAVI in these kind of very calcified aortic stenosis, so what are the complications you have to take into consideration could happen? So I think for, for, for this patient, first, if it is calcified, stroke is one of the issues. Uh, sizing is going to be a real challenge. You know, we may discuss that afterwards, so we may have uh, a kind of uh, uh, undersizing of the procedure of the prosthesis or so regurgitation. So with the inherent uh, risk of uh, embolization if the device is uh, too small. So there are a couple of uh, specific risks for this uh, uh, particular uh, scenario. I don't personally believe that the risk of uh, uh, tearing that, uh, uh, that cavity and uh, creating a connection between the aorta and the, and, and the ventricle, I don't think that this is going to happen. It's more about regurgitation, uh, uh, embolization, and stroke for myself. Mm. And what about you, Mohamed? What's your perception? Yeah, I agree, of course, on all the risks you mentioned. Um, I think this is also a case uh, where Luckily, this mass is not present anywhere where if you like push it hardly, it would cause an annular rupture because it's, uh, it will probably then, um, as you mentioned, cause some sort of an intracavitary connection between the uh, left and the right ventricle. But, uh, but you're right because it's heavily calcified and probably it sits here for, for a long time. Maybe it already caused this AV block five years ago. Uh, because of its position. Um, but we were not sure because, again, as you mentioned, we, we don't have enough, enough experience with these very nasty anatomies. So, again, the main concerns, as, as you mentioned, were uh, stroke um, and um, getting a valve in that is correctly sized, that could seal appropriately, um, um, and um, on the other hand, functions appropriately because also you don't, you're not sure how your valve will expand in such an anatomy um, and whether this could affect uh, leaflet function afterwards, depending on the type of prosthesis you are choosing. Um, so back to the question by Lars, if this was a, a very, or a younger patient that is not frail, then this would be like, for me, an easy thing. I would ask my surgeon to operate on him and, and um, to avoid all these, uh, all these difficult questions we are asking ourselves now. But um, in this particular patient, um, I think surgery would not have been a, go a good option. This is why we had to uh, confront ourselves with these questions. So Mohammed, just to summarize, this case is a high risk TAVI case. We had talked about the risk of residual gradient, pavelvular leak, valve, embolization, endless rupture and stroke, but this patient have no other option than a TAVI. So what is your considerations when you choose uh, a valve for this specific patient? 
Yeah, so it's a good question, and, and we, we, we don't have enough data for all types of anatomies. We have some nice randomized trials that compare the devices, but they usually compare devices when the anatomy is suitable for, for, for all device types. And this is why the device choice in this particular anatomy, I think, will be based on your own experience and feeling. So, and, and every device type would have advantages and disadvantages. So, for example, if you take a balloon expandable device, it's probably the fastest to implant, but then it's really just one shot you have. And either it works or it doesn't work. So you, you don't have a lot of control on it. So you need to consider this beforehand. And um, you can also, you can change your mind, obviously, of, because of sizing considerations. So you'll be uh, committed to use um, a certain size. If you take a self-expanding uh, or a, a mechanically expanding device, then you are not committed. So you can reposition. Uh, for the mechanically expanding device, you can even take your time and have a complete, almost complete deployment. And if the valve doesn't fit, if it's too big or too small, you can take it out and take another one. So this would be an advantage to repositionable valves. Um, a self-expanding device would probably have the advantage of hemodynamics. Uh, if, it's, if you can implant it supraannually, probably in this anatomy, it, you will avoid the calcification completely and your valve leaflets will be in another position, so it will function nicely. But it could have problems with sealing. Um, and you don't know how it will react. You cannot judge on this, even if it's repositionable. It's not repositionable 100%. So you will have to wait and see. And probably you will need to pre and post dilate. And this is something that you may want to avoid with this particular anatomy. So with the mechanically expanding device, again, you have the option of repositioning. You have probably the best sealing. And then you have also the possibility of um, um, repositioning a little bit higher, a little bit lower, avoiding pre and post dilatation maybe, um, and depending on the mechanical expansion properties. So, so gently massaging this mass and see how it works. And if it doesn't work, you can, you can take it out. Um, the one maybe drawback of the mechanically expanding device is probably you will take a, a little bit of a smaller valve compared to a self-expanding and you probably end up with a little bit higher. That was a great uh, conclusion, uh, Mohammed. So, so let's move to you, Gigi, and, and hear about some tips and tricks for valve selection and also for implantation technique. So, Gigi, please. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Lars. So let's uh, uh, let me drive you through complex calcified RX stenosis, all the implications for technique and device uh, selection. Here are my conflicts of uh, interest. Uh, when we talk about severely calcified anatomies, we have to understand that the calcium may be located at the level of the leaflets. It may be also located at the level of the auric annulus, which sometimes so some, uh, some very localized uh, chunk of calcium, or it may be a diffuse pattern uh, concerning both the leaflets, the auric annulus, and the left ventricular outflow tract, apart from this rare situation that we've seen in that typical uh, clinical case with the uh, caseous uh, degeneration. And all these situations carry a risk of annular rupture. We discussed that perivalvular regurgitation, and these are the uh, uh, the things that we have to uh, keep in mind when it comes to device selection. Let me give you a, a quick uh, example. This is a, a case that we have uh, published uh, many years ago. It was at the time of uh, uh, the use of a Sapien XT, and you, you see clearly that chunk of calcium localized in relation of the. Uh, uh, the left to posterior part of the auric annulus, and we decided in this situation to use a balloon expandable platform. And uh, this was a typical uh, deployment, very slow because we had already integrated the risk of uh, perforation for this uh, patient. And you, you're going to see that despite this very, very slow uh, inflation, what we had was a, a perforation just located uh, in the uh, posterior aspect of the uh, aortic annulus. And you see that uh, flow, that contrast, uh, falling into uh, the left atrium and part of the, uh, the pericardial space. So this was uh, easily solved by uh, the uh, deployment of the second valve, but this, it, it, this is definitely something that we have to anticipate and uh, to try to avoid. How can we do that? Uh, pro, uh, definitely by a proper device selection. This is another with an extremely calcified anatomy. Once again, calcium located 
uh, at the level of the Arctic analysts, uh, plus extremely bulky uh, lithids. So we decided for this uh, patient to use a mechanically expanded uh, device. And you see that despite the early uh, click and the need for uh, reposition because of the calcium, we ended with a device that was in place, sealing properly, no per uh, perforation and, and no uh, regurgitation. So these are uh, some of the uh, features and some of the outcomes that we uh, may integrate when it comes to uh, device selection, avoiding rupture, avoiding regurgitation. So definitely the mechanical expansion, the repositionability and the efficiency with the uh, adaptive seal are some of the features of the lattice edge a device that may be of value when it comes to calcific aortic valves. So uh, it's true and it's, uh, this has been uh, reproduced in uh, various registries and uh, even in randomized trials like the reprise free randomized trial. And we, uh, we have now more understanding about the uh, efficiency of devices in achieving no uh, moderate or severe regurgitation. And when we come, we uh, consider the three year uh, results of the uh, reprise free uh, trial. You can clearly see that the vast majority of the patients that were treated with the Lotus device had no or trace or even mild uh, regurgitation at three years follow up. And this, will, this is really impressive. Calcium uh, burden is something that is uh, difficult to appreciate. And uh, it's always difficult. And you've seen that through the discussion that we had previously and with the perception from uh, Mohamed, from Lars and myself, that uh, we have the feeling that some device may be yet better and more appropriately when it comes to uh, uh, tackling a high amount of calcium. And it's really interesting that uh, to see that for some uh, self-expanding platforms, the more calcium we have, the more moderate or severe paravagular regurgitation we, we get. Uh, uh, while with the mechanical, uh, mechanically expanded Lotus device, uh, regardless of the amount of calcium, we get the same result with no regurgitation, no moderate or severe regurgitation. So this is something that may be of value when, you come, when it comes to the, the question of highly calcified uh, uh, anatomies. This is another uh, situation that is uh, really, uh, that is more and more frequently seen in uh, daily practice is, uh, it is bicuspid valves. Bicuspid artery valves have uh, inherent uh, issues, uh, uh, for example, sizing, the asymmetrical expansion of the stent frame, the risk of embolization, the risk of rupture, the risk of regurgitation uh, requiring a second uh, device. And uh, this has been proven in uh, the, the former registries with first generation devices. The need for a second valve and the, uh, the final regurgitation rate seems to be higher in the uh, in bicuspid valve. It's uh, probably something that we have to uh, understand more by uh, gathering data, accumulating data within prospective registries or even uh, probably a randomized trials. But uh, this is just an example of a patient with a difficult sizing because you know that sizing is quite challenging in bicuspid patients. With uh, the analysts providing sizing for one sub out size, the supranodal tracing for another uh, one. And with uh, that uh, device that is able to more or less conform to the anatomy of the landing zone with an adequate reshaping, avoiding to be too aggressive, we may end up with a, a good uh, location of the device one device utilized, no need for post allotation, no regurgitation. And these are features that are, to my opinion, extremely interesting also. So calcium burden um, is something when it comes to uh, regurgitation and rupture, but it seems also to be associated with a higher stroke rate, uh, the risk of stroke. And this was first proven by a Raj Markov uh, in the bike speed uh, analysis from the STS TVT a registry focusing on the balloon expandable platforms. And this, were, uh, this was for the first time, uh, the uh, evidence of uh, signals of increased stroke rate in, when we do TAVI in bicuspid patients. So this probably has to do something with the amount of calcium of this particular anatomy. We have a couple of studies that are quite interesting. And this one is interesting because it, uh, it tells us that if we have extreme calcifications at the level of the aortic valve and not uh, in the overall aortic root, this is probably going to increase the uh, uh, delayed stroke rate of the patients, uh, patient after a transcatheter aortic valve implantation. So we have to uh, 
to keep this into consideration to uh, maybe better protect and try to reduce the very procedural strokes that, uh, strokes that occur that may be uh, silent initially and uh, become more uh, more symptomatic uh, in the uh, upcoming weeks for uh, procedure. So if we have a huge calcium load at, at the level of the arctic valve, this may be a signal for a, uh, an increased risk of, uh, of stroke. Also, uh, when we have a calcium at the a level of the valve ventricular at low tract, in that publication, this was associated with a higher stroke rate. So definitely, calcification in the landing zone may be associated with a higher stroke rate. So how do we uh, prevent that? We uh, we have various server protection devices, and uh, the one that is uh, that has covered most of the experience so far, apart from the TriGuard, the Keystone TriGuard device, is the uh, the Sentinel device. And you, um, I'm not going to go, I'm not going too much into details about that device that you all uh, know, but uh, we have uh, we have a couple of uh, data from literature providing very positive signals for the use of server protection devices that may reduce, as it was the case in the Sentinel. USID trial from two thirds, the occurrence of early strokes, uh, periprocedural strokes, three days post uh, a procedure. We need randomized trials to uh, validate these findings, but maybe in calcified uh, anatomies, there could be a value of a systematic use of cerebral protection devices. So uh, what are the essentials to uh, remember? Uh, the first thing is that severely calcified anatomies naturally ca carry non-exhaustively ex a risk for arctic regurgitation, annular rupture and stroke, we've discussed that. Uh, device selection clearly plays a role in preventing these complications and the mechanical expansion and sealing properties of the lotus edge could be considered in highly calcified anatomies. Not the regular ones, but the most calcified ones could benefit from uh, these properties. And cerebral protection devices, given the association of the uh, calcium burden and location uh, with stroke, may play a role uh, in preventing that uh, complication in highly calcified anatomies. So having said that, I'm uh, handing over to you, uh, Lars, for uh, the discussion. Thank you. That was a great talk, uh, Gigi, about uh, how to handle these patients. Um, and and uh, Mohammed, um, we were talking about cerebral embolic protection device, and I think most sites who are using uh, these devices uh, will use it in severely calcified aortic stenosis at this case. But otherwise, how do you see in Leipzig? What, where, is, where is the place for these valves? It is for everyone where it fits into, or it's only for selected patients? I mean, I think it's good that now some randomized trials are, are going to start really with clinical endpoints because I think this will be, at the end of the day, uh, if these trials are positive, then it will be um, a device to be used in all patients, I guess. And currently, because of several reasons, we are trying to pick out patients, but I'm not sure whether we know which patients really benefit. But we, we try to, we have our own like internal guidelines which includes severe calcification of the valve. They also include the presence of some sort of hostile uh, arch. Um, if you have a lot of material or like uh, atheroma in the aortic arch on the way to the valve. And they include some particular subtypes of patients like patients with bicuspids or patients with valve and valve or patients with the previous stroke, uh, which we consider to be at high risk for, for, for recurrent stroke. So these are currently the patients we are choosing for for embolic protection, they represent maybe around 40%, 45% of our yeah. current patients. Yeah, makes makes sense. So, Gigi, you, you showed nicely that um, you can treat patients uh, with bicuspid aortic valves with TAVI, having in mind these patients are often elderly patients. But if you expect that TAVI is going to move not only to patients at lower surgical risk, but also to younger patients, we're going to see much more patients coming forward with bicuspid aortic valve and often the calcification is more severe in these younger patients. Are there a role for TAVI yeah, in these true. younger patients with bicuspid aortic valve, or how do you see it? I think it's uh, it's something that we have to uh, really try to uh, understand as a, a community who is a, a good candidate for TAVI in a bicuspid uh, setup and a highly calcified anatomy, particularly if the patient is young and could theoretically deserve surgery. 
uh, when it comes to uh, to biocaspid, apart from cerebral protection and all the steps like pre-dilatation, post-dilatation, to make sure that we obtain the perfect result achievable for a, a given patient, I would uh, consider in a young patient uh, potential contraindications uh, to TAVI. Uh, for example, for example, a large uh, aortic aneurysm that could uh, require surgery, or a diffuse uh, disease of the the, at the coronary uh, level or some calcium pattern that may, that may uh, anticipate a suboptimal result would be for, to my opinion, some, um, a good indication for uh, surgery in this patient. So understanding who is not a good candidate for TAVI is going to be a fa of paramount importance in younger patients with highly calcified anatomies. Okay, yeah, I agree. So, so let's move to the, to the final talk, uh, Mohamed. Um, can you please show us how you actually executed this uh, case of TAVI in this very complex anatomy? Yeah, of course. So, um, um, as we uh, mentioned, again, I don't have any disclosures. Um, as we mentioned, um, we were thinking about the pros and cons of each device type. We, we already touched on this. So with, in this particular case with the balloon expandable device, we wouldn't have a lot of sizing issues because the annual range was here, um, regardless of the way you measure, uh, it was a 26 uh, or in the range of a 26 millimeter device, but you have the risk of rupture VSD and the high risk of disrupting, embolizing this, uh, this uh, content um, that is probably inside the uh, calcified mass. With the self-expanding device, you have an uncertainty in sizing, so it could be 29 or 34, depending on how you measure. Um, you have a certain risk of PVL, and we discussed this, and we showed the, the data from price three. And of course, you have a risk of disruption again, because probably you would need to pre or at least post dilate. With the mechanically expanding device, we have um, less um, 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 considerations about uh, risk of rupture. We have the possibility, the possibility to reposition um, um, and um, to check the results concerning uh, paravalvular leaks. We are, um, we could have some size, sizing issues because if you measure on the low range, uh, as we showed, it would be 25 device. If you measure on the high range, then it would be 27 device. But again, this you have this more or less um, controllable because you can switch between device sizes. Um, so this is why we, at the end of the day, we were more comfortable of choosing a mechanically expanding device because the anatomy is very hostile. We were not sure what we're dealing with and we did want to have everything under control. And I think this is one advantage of the Lotus uh, mechanically expanding device that you can uh, control what you're doing. Um, this is just a table showing you the differences between the Lotus and the Lotus Edge. So the Lotus Classic, the older generation, um, compared to the current generation Lotus Edge, you have the same adaptive seal and then, uh, in, then the known braided knitting oil frame with the Lotus Edge. You have early valve function, you have currently still the same sizes, so 23, 25, 27. But in addition to, the, um, to these characteristics, you have the depth guard technology, which helps you a little bit of, in getting this device a little bit higher, or it avoids a, a deep dive in, into the ventricle and probably could reduce a little bit the pacemakers. You have radio opaque markers, uh, on the uh, buckles and posts that help you assess locking in only one view. So it simplifies the assessment of locking. You could use an, 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 a smaller sheath, um, a 15 French uh, expandable sheath um, instead of the larger one that should be used with the Lotus Classic. And the delivery system, it, it's still a bit stiff, but it's um, supposedly a little bit uh, more flexible compared to the Lotus Classic. Um, on these images, you see that we have chosen a 25 device, so we were a little bit concerned of a lot of, of taking a bigger device in this anatomy because we thought it may not expand quite nicely. Um, so we thought, let's take the smaller device and allow it to expand in this calcified anatomy. And if it's too small or if we cannot get the perfect seal, then we would exchange. 
we decided to take a sentinel embolic protection device because of the previously mentioned consideration regarding stroke. And our plan was to skip pre and possibly post dilatation. You can see here that we had some difficulties in crossing the arch that was a little bit tortuous, and this is why we did this aortic arch angiogram, but at the end of the day, it was possible to cross. Um, this is the attempt to deploy the lotus valve, the 25 millimeter lotus edge, and according to the current implantation guidelines, which are different compared to the lotus classic, you start at a higher position, which would be around uh, eight millimeter below the inner plane. Um, and this is how the valve looked like in the semi-locked position. We had some difficulties in locking despite taking the smaller device, which is probably related to the presence of this calcified chunk. And what you also like commonly see with this, um, with, the new, with the new implantation technique, that if you start a little bit too high, the device, the distal part of the netinol frame sometimes gets caught on the um, uh, calcified uh, anatomy. And then you have some sort of an asymmetric expansion. As you can see here, it looks a little bit asymmetric. The valve maybe looks a little bit like a champagne cork. It doesn't have a lot of waste, but it seems to be struggling uh, in the LVOT. You can also see that this valve, at least in this shape and position, it was not sealing quite nicely. Um, and this is again the advantage of this device. We could, um, um, you can control it. So we decided to reposition or resheath and reposition. And this is what you see here on this um, image um, and on the cartoon on the right hand side that you can easily uh, resheath and reposition. And in this particular case, we went only a few millimeters deeper in order to get away from the calcium. And this allows the device to. Um, expand in a rather more symmetrical way. This is how it looked like. You see, um, again, we don't have a lot of waste. So um, we are rather on the, like, um, um, we are not oversizing a lot with this 25 device, but it appears to seal here, uh, at least better compared to the first implantation. Uh, the frame looks nicer, the ceiling uh, is better, but we again had some difficulties in locking. And you can see here, the, see this demonstrated here on this, um, buckle and post in the middle of the picture on the right side. Um, it's very, it's, it's actually a spot diagnosis. So if you see a, a radiolucent uh, part between these two radio opaque markers, then you're, you're not locked. And obviously the other two buckles and posts are nicely locked. What you can do here, and this is something you should expect in calcified anatomies, that you will have difficulties in locking. So you, you should know exactly how to deal with it. So the first thing you can do, uh, particularly if you um, like, you have a premature clicking while opening or while uh, unsheathing the device, then you turn this um, knob again um, uh, in a counterclockwise, um, um, in a clockwise fashion to um, to get rid of this uh, early click, and then try to lock again, uh, maybe a little bit slower than your first attempt. If this is not successful, then you probably would need to centralize the uh, valve um, uh, or the catheter a little bit more um, and help um, through like some push maneuver to uh, coaxially align the buckles and posts. And if this is not successful, then some push and pulling maneuver, as you can see here in this video. So while doing the counterclockwise rotation, while going into the locking position, the first operator is pushing and pulling a little bit to relax the tension into in that is present in the system. And this is actually what helped us in this case to achieve um, um, the locking, particularly of this um, uh, center post. And you can see on the left-hand side, again, that with this radio opaque, uh, um, with these radio opaque markers present on the back of the post, you can easily see in one view that all uh, of the three are locked. And then what you uh, need to know, particularly in these calcified anatomies, that the moment you click and um, the moment you release the uh, tension in the system, then these gaps reappear. You can see here that the gaps reappeared on the right hand side, which is quite normal. And then when you release, partially release the valve, the first stage of valve release, you get the pin coil 
uh, up, as you can see here, then you need to make sure that the valve remains locked. And if it remains locked, then you're on the safe side, you can implant the valve. If something happened, you st still have um, a bailout option. This is how the valve looked like after final release. Um, it's a good position, actually a very nice expansion with only minimal regurgitation. You can see here that we caught something in the filters, which were examined afterwards, but it turned out to be like fibrin rich material with some lymphocytes and it was not uh, calcium um, and closure of the access site was um, like a routine thing. Um, afterwards, you see here the post-procedure result. The uh, mean gradient was 18 uh, and the patient had traced paravalic on echo. So we thought that this mean gradient of 18, it may be a little bit high, it could be normal for this particular device size and in this anatomy. So we needed to check and we also needed to, or wanted to look how the valve actually expanded on CT in this uh, peculiar anatomy. So we don't do this in every patient, but this is a very peculiar anatomy and we, um, we want to demonstrate how the device interacts or interacted with the anatomy. You can see here the nice expansion uh, very symmetrical, maybe a little bit asymmetrical in the LVOT, but uh, more or less complete expansion. Uh, we see that this caseous mass has been partially compressed, but it's still there. And you can see some mild hypoattenuated leaflet thickening um, with some affection of motion on two cusps. Um, this is why we decided, I, I, I know this is, um, this is maybe off-label, but it's, it's a particular decision this patient we might, may want to discuss. We thought to give him anticoagulation for a, a few months just to make sure that this hypoattenuation does not increase and that valve function is maintained. And we have very recently seen this patient after six months. He had significant clinical improvement. His mean gradient was reduced to 10 on a, um, on a, a direct oral anticoagulant, on a NOAC or a DOAC, and he still had three filiars, so he was doing fine. So um, my last slide would summarize this case. And then we can discuss again, this is a rare case of a caseous degeneration of the aortic valve. The clinical indication for TAVI, I guess, was clear, but the uh, anatomical um, considerations um, or the anatomy was more or less considered to be hostile to the majority of available devices. We use the mechanically expanding lotus edge valve, which ha could have advantages in these confusing or big anatomies, maybe because of uh, safety considerations, the repositionability function, and the sealing properties. However, we need to know that these anatomies remain challenging. Uh, they require particular attention to the implantation technique and also to post-procedure care. Um, and by this, um, I give uh, the word back to Lars, and uh, I think we can discuss the case uh, briefly. Thank you. So that was a very nice outcome, uh, Mohammed, uh, in a very complex uh, anatomy. Uh, so Lotus, the Lotus valve performed very well in this um, severely calcified aortic stenosis. GJ, what is your, uh, which anatomy would you consider to use uh, the valve, uh, the Lotus valve in, in oh, no, let's do this again. Mohammed, this was a very, Mohammed, this was a great outcome uh, of the Lotus valve in a very complex anatomy, heavily calcified aortic stenosis. Gigi, in which anatomy would you prefer a dosis valve uh, to have an optimal outcome for the patient? Uh, I think it's a, it's a very interesting device when you have a combination of the risk of annular rupture, if you use something that is a balloon expanding or regurgitation, if you uh, need to uh, use a self-expanding device and maybe post dilate and combine the, uh, the risk of rupture again. So it's a, uh, when it is heavily calcified, Lotus is a device of, uh, of choice for sure, like in bicuspid aortic valves. And the location of the calcium, as, as we've seen uh, through the case and the, uh, the presentation, uh, is really important. The annular location of calcification or extremely calcified leaflets are good indications for, for me. And also, uh, one final indication, when you are in a gray zone between two sizes and you don't know exactly which one to use, this may be a a very a useful device because you can still uh, recapture and use the bigger size or the smaller one if needed. So I think this session nicely addressed uh, that uh, TAVI in complex calcified aortic stenosis can be challenging. There's a risk of 
uh, complications with paravalvular leak, endless ruptures, stroke, valve embolization, and so on. And also that a pre-procedural imaging is crucial for, for success of the procedure to really understand the anatomy of these patients. And also we have seen that the lotus edge is an efficient and safe transcatheter heart valve in these severely calcified aortic stenosis, including patients with bicuspid aortic valve. So with this, I want to conclude the session. I want to thank uh, Mohammed and Gigi for doing this session with me, for you to attend the session, and finally to Boston Scientific Tour for sponsoring the session. Goodbye.